tissues. Now we're moving on to the fun stuff, right? Let's be done with all the tiny little molecular stuff and move on to something that we can see. Well, you have to use a microscope to see it, but <laughs> we have four different kinds of tissues. And for this exam, we're going to really concentrate on the details of epithelium and connective tissue. I'm going to include a little bit at the end about muscle tissue and about nervous tissue, but because we're going to go into more detail in those for exams three and exams four, I'm just going to hit the highlights for those. Since all of your organs are made up of tissues, a thorough understanding of tissue is required in order to understand the structure and function of body organs. In this chapter, you'll learn about the various types of tissues, and you'll also learn about tissue repair. As a healthcare professional, it's very important for you to understand tissue repair so that you can treat and monitor any tissue damage in your patients. For example, one common type of tissue damage nurses encounter are decubitus ulcers, which result from a continuous pressure on a certain area of the body. The most common decubitus ulcer you're likely to encounter is a bed sore, which usually occurs when a patient has been lying in one position for an extended period of time. The constant pressure restricts blood flow to the area, which damages the tissue. This is a common problem with diabetic patients, since their blood flow is typically already impaired. This means that their wounds may heal more slowly or not heal at all. Treatment of bed sores always involves moving or turning the patient to take the pressure off the wound in order to encourage blood flow to the affected area. Restoring blood flow is extremely important to tissue repair and vital to the healing process of a bed sore. Understanding the process of tissue repair is crucial to treating patients with bed sores and other types of tissue damage. So this is from chapter one, right? Tissues are a group of cells that perform a common or related function. Histology is the study of tissues. Remember, the study of cells is cytology. But when we actually take a piece of tissue, let's say we take the kidney, and we use something called a microtome, and we cut it very, very thin, one cell layer thick, and mount it on a slide and process it so that it will be a usable slide forever and ever and ever, that's histology. So... For basic tissue types, like I just said, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue, we're really going to go into the details of the epithelial and connective tissues, leaving uh, the details for muscle and nervous tissue for later. I'll just get into the highlights of those. So epithelial tissue is going to be in sheets. Uh, they actually have those tight junctions that we talked about in um, chapter two, three, 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 um, where they, they like to stick together. Epithelial tissue has these tight junctions and they like to be stuck together really well by tight junctions. Okay, so we have glands are a type of epithelial tissue. And then we have linings and cover. So uh, your mucous membranes, so the things that actually meet in the outside world, that's gonna have an epithelial layer. And then your skin is actually a cutaneous membrane. That's gonna be epithelium also. So what makes epithelial unique. Polarity. I'm going to get into the details of all these things in a minute. Polarity. Specialized contacts. Uh, they are usually sitting on top of some sort of connective tissue, so the connective tissue is supportive. It does not have blood vessels running through it. They have to get their nutrients and stuff uh, through some of those channels that we talked about 
or maybe through endocytosis, but there is no vessels running through the epithelial layer. Avascular. It does have nerves. It can feel. So your skin cells, if you actually get a cut and you bleed, you've gone through the whole epithelium into the connective tissue underneath. But when that little two millimeter spider jumps on your arm, can you feel it? Absolutely, and you go cuckoo, right? Okay, epithelial tissue is amazingly regenerative. You get a boo-boo in your epithelium, you heal nicely. And then epithelium has lots and 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 lots of cells. So. Is there other stuff besides cells? Sometimes, but it's mostly cells. What is polarity? Well, that means that, you know, polar opposites, that means that it has difference from one side to the other side. One side would be the top, the part that's meeting the quote unquote outside world, and that's the apical surface. The other is the bottom, which is going to be closest to the connective tissue layer, and that's called the base or the basal surface. Uh, we've got that's where the attachment is. There's usually like a um, a sheet, a basement membrane sheet there, and it's often called the basal lamina. Um, and you can take an epithelial cell and you can tell which is the top and which is the bottom because they look different. They have different structures, they have different functions. This right here, you're gonna see this in lab. So this is simple columnar epithelium. Um, in lab, we'll talk about how simple means a single layer Stratified means multiple layers. So, I'm gonna get this little guy right here. This is one columnar, doesn't he look like a column? Cell. He has a phospholipid bilayer around him. Um, this would be the apical surface. So I'm gonna tell you that this is intestines. So your food is gonna be going do, 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 like that. And this part right here is connective tissue, okay? So we've got a basement membrane that it's sitting on, that basal lamina right here. And it is a single layer of uh, cells. So simple columnar epithelium. Apical surface where the food's passing by, basal surface is the side with the connective tissue. Specialized contacts. So, um, tight junctions, desmosomes, those are going to make sure that those cells are stuck really good together. When you get a sunburn, you can visualize how that happens, right? You get a sunburn and you start to peel, it comes off in sheets. It comes off in sheets because it's just, it's they're stuck together by these tight junctions. On the sides, they have desmosomes, which are like zippers. And then again, underneath epithelial tissue is connective tissue because connective tissue is gonna have the blood supply. And so the, those tiny little capillaries are hanging out in that connective tissue and um, making sure that the epithelium gets whatever kind of nutrients that it needs. Cancer cells break the rules. Cancer cells break through that basement membrane and start to invade other areas. So avascular, but innervated, no blood vessels. If you look at that slide that we just did, that was nothing but simple columnar cells. There's no blood vessels. Now he can feel things. There's definitely innervation but he gets the nourishment from the connective tissue underneath. 
highly regenerative. So I just showed you the simple columnar that was from the gut, right? So you put food from the outside world into your mouth and it passes on down, okay? Let's say you get a GI virus and you have vomiting and diarrhea horrifically for 24 hours, you think you're gonna die. And then the next day, it's all over, but you know, not quite right yet. Maybe you sip on some Sprite, eat some crackers, or ask your loved one to bring you some chicken noodle soup. In three days, you're eating some chorizo and some pizza, and life is good. You got good poop, and you're not throwing up anymore because that epithelium regenerated. Isn't that incredible? Some of these areas are really exposed to friction, like your skin. Uh, maybe you really like to eat jalapeno peppers, and so you're always asking a lot of your gut, just for example. Um, anything that meets the outside world has potential to get uh, maybe roughhoused, so it needs to be replaced. Epithelial tissue is going to be named by the numbers of layers, so like I just said, simple columnar and then I said if it's layered it's going to be stratified boom here you go the only stratified type of epithelium that we look at in AMP1 in lab is going to be stratified epithelium so areas that need a lot of protection your mouth your esophagus think Dorito that you didn't chew up good enough and now that point is scraping down your esophagus and you feel it but it doesn't poke a hole and go into your chest because it's layered um let's see where's stratified um meeting the outside world, urethra, vagina. These kind of things are all listed in your lab book. And remember, if it's in your lab book, it's fair game for a lab test. So you need to memorize those things. Okay, so then after the layered part, then what does the cell actually look like? So part two of the name is going to be like columnar. And it was a column, was it not? Cuboidal, it's going to look like a square. It's going to look like a cube. Squamous means scale, so it's going to be flat. This picture right here is showing um, simple stratified on the top, and then, I mean, simple squamous on the top, and then stratified squamous on the bottom. Now, as we get towards the basement membrane, that bottom layer is actually a bunch of stem cells. So they're um, more cube-ish, and the stratified squamous part, the squamous part, the flat part, is going to be more evident as you get towards the top. Each of those layers in the skin is going to have different names and we'll get to that in chapter five but this would same thing if you're talking about uh stratified squamous for um your esophagus or whatever it's going to be the same idea it's just it won't have um skin color because that's color is specific to skin So what's the purpose of sympath epithelium? Again, lab and lecture go together. This is from your lab book. Epithelial, simple epithelium is important for absorption and secretion and filtration. No ATP required. We need it to be easy. Why? Well, because the most important areas that you're going to look at are going to be that you're going to find this simple um simple squamous is going to be the capillaries and the lungs. I need oxygen and carbon dioxide to exchange simple simon. Carbon dioxide and oxygen are both um, nonpolar, so therefore they can get through those hydrophobic tails quite easily and exchange quick. If I'm a single layer of flat cells, 
no problem. I can get right through. There's a couple of other areas that we'll mention as we go into especially uh, A and P2. Endothelium is going to be lining all the lymphatic vessels, blood vessels, your heart. So it's one continuous area of simple epithelium. He's got a special name, endothelium. So this simple squamous epithelium, just like we're all people, but you've got your own name. Endothelium is simple squamous, but he's got his own name, endothelium. And then the serous membranes are actually their fancy name. They are simple squamous, but they are a modified type of simple squamous, and they have a name mesothelium or mesothelium. This is simple squamous epithelium, single cell layer thick. And in lab, you're not going to look at capillaries. You're going to look at alveoli. So this is those air sacs in the lungs. So this would all be air right here. And you have millions of these tiny little sacs in your lungs. Okay. And what is going to be fused to the alveolar uh, basement membrane is the capillary basement membrane so that they are those guys are stuck together to make sure that we can exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen perfectly so so important to stay alive but like looky here this is one flat cell and then this is one flat cell there's one in between them but then here's one flat cell. And you know, a microtome is going through these tissues and the cells are three-dimensional. When you've put them on a slide, they're two-dimensional, right? Picture is two-dimensional, the actual object is three-dimensional. So sometimes you might even miss the nucleus. I would venture to guess this right here is a cell and the microtome barely missed the nucleus. I see a little bit of purple right here. So each of these is one cell. Simple cuboidal, where you're going to find those guys, they're going to be in glands. So remember, glands are a type of epithelium. And kidney tubules is another very common place. Uh, do we have it in other places? Yes, but we're just going to stick to the ones in the lab book, okay? So simple, a single layer, cuboidal. They're shaped like a cube. These guys are involved in both secretion and absorption. And here we go. These are kidney tubules. So, you know, and remember, microtomes can squish things. This picture is how life would be if um, everything was perfect. We all know that life is not perfect. But can you appreciate that this is one of those guys? This is one of those guys. This right here probably missed the nucleus because it's a microtome and it cut it. There's one. There's one. Missed the nucleus. Here's one. Missed the nucleus. Okay. So this would be a transverse cut through a tube. So like if you just cut a hose, right, and you look down into the center of the hose. But what if you did a longitudinal cut? of a hose so you cut it lengthwise that would be depicted right here so filtrate going to become urine passing through the tube right here and here's a cube here's a cube so um maybe this is not the maybe this isn't a, uh how do you say the they missed the tube part right here so this is like the top of the tube you can't tell because it's a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object simple columnar we just looked at those guys also invo involved in absorption and secretion um simple so single layer columnar they're tall now these guys sometimes they're going to have extra stuff on top also we're going to see in lab in between these simple columnar cells sometimes you're going to see something called a goblet cell and they secrete mucus they don't take up stain because they're full of snot 
right? <laughs> they're full of mucus anyway, so they're clear. Where do we find these guys? Lots of places. Um, we're going to find them in the digestive tract. I'm going to find a certain kind in the bronchus. You're going to find them in the uterus. But what we're going to look at in lab is the digestive tract. So here you go. This is small intestines. Your food would be passing through right here. Do, 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 do. Right, this person's or whatever creature's tummy is empty. There's nothing there. Uh, but this is a column right there. You see? And notice how there's all this fuzzy right here. Fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy. Uh, can't do that. Fuzzy, 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 fuzzy. That's called the brush border. And in fact, if you open up some intestines and you actually look at it, it looks like velvet. So the tops of, so the apical surface of this simple columnar in the gut, it's loaded with microvilli. So these, they have villi and microvilli. And the purpose of those guys is to increase surface area, to increase the amount of absorption and secretion that it can do. Here's these little goblet cells that I was talking about. Get my pointer. Here's one right here. He doesn't take up stain because he's mostly mucus. This one is actually excreting something right now. How cool. Da, 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 da. Those guys are called goblet cells, and they sure could show up on your lab test. They make mucus. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. The word ciliate is not in here, but it is in your lab book. Pseudo fake. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So what happens is these guys vary in height and they look like they're multi-layered, but they're not. It's just a single letter, layer and some of them cut shorter than others. Um, in lab, we're going to look at a trachea. So it's going to have some cilia on it. If you smoke, you destroy your cilia. Good thing it's epithelium. It regenerates. Stop smoking, you get your cilia back. The purpose of the cilia is to make sure that we're always trying to keep whatever you breathe in, whether it's dust or pollen or whatever, the cilia is going to grab it and the cilia is always beating and it's trying to bring whatever dust pollens or whatever that made it down your airway, it'll bring it up to your throat and you can swallow it. So here's a picture. Can you see how it looks layered? Because here's a nucleus, and then here's a nucleus, and then here's a nucleus. But it's not. Uh, just some of the cells are cut shorter than the others. They almost twist on themselves like a rope. And that's why the microtome, when it cuts through it, um, like shag carpet. Remember shag carpet? The piling is twisted on itself. So sometimes when you cut it, you just get a part of a cell, which makes it look pretty short. But in fact, let's follow this little guy right here. Oh, I should pick a different color. Black. Black. Okay. Do, 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 do. Like that. That's a cell. The cilia is the giveaway. This is the only pseudostratified that we do. It's got cilia on the ends. So on that last one with the simple columnar and it had the microvilli, it looks fuzzy. It's called a brush border like an old fashioned hairbrush that was made out of horse hair or whatever, you know, polyester hairs, whatever. These are definite, defined, individual hairs. So it's not just fuzzy. It's it's like eyelashes. Individual cilia. He also has these um, goblet cells like this right here that secrete mucus. So you know if you get some sort of tracheitis or bronchitis and sometimes you start coughing up snotty stuff that came from those goblet cells.
Okay, stratified epithelium. Stratified, more than one layer. The regeneration actually happens at the basal surface. So those basal cells, which are actually a type of stem cell, those guys are the guys that are going to go through mitosis and they slowly migrate upwards. We're going to do that in skin. You'll see it. Because of the multiple layers, he's more protective. His role is for protection. The top layer is the flat cell. It's going to be areas of high wear and tear, things that meet the outside world um, that are going to be more damageable, like your esophagus. Once you swallow the Dorito and you didn't chew the point off of it, right, it goes through the esophagus. You can feel it scraping down, but then it's going to get into the stomach, and that stomach is going to pummel it like a hammer. So it's going to make it nice and small and get rid of the point that you didn't chew up enough because you were so excited to get a Dorito. Now, the stratified squamous is all the, the same looking except I mentioned your skin on the outside world, it has a color. It has a lot of melanin, okay? Everybody's got a different amount of melanin that creates color. Also, your skin has a protein in it called keratin. So um, the other areas except skin do not have keratin and they stay quite moist. Your cutaneous membranes, so the epithelium of your skin, is not moist. So here's a picture of a histology slide. So down here, it's going to be the basal layer. And just the first cell layer is going to be the guy that goes through mitosis. And then they slowly move, move up. So this is esophagus, but uh, we're going to occasionally replace these guys, right? Because it's regenerative. And once we get up here and that Dorito passes by, that layer is that everywhere where that Dorito scraped is going to end up in your stomach and you're going to digest it. But that's okay because you have all of this stuff to come and replace it and this stuff to come and replace that, etc., etc. Now, this one is not in lab. This one is just lecture. Um, transitional epithelium is a stratified tissue and he transitions into different shapes. So it depends on how full whatever vessel it's lining is. Let's do the bladder. That's easy. Everybody grasps that sometimes your bladder is empty and sometimes your bladder is full. As your bladder fills up, it stretches, and as it stretches, these cells that are layered and squished and small are going to stretch out and become flatter, just like a balloon. So here we go. This So it transitions shape as the organ stretches. So it stretches because of the connective tissue underneath probably has some elastic tissue in it. But um, transitional cell carcinoma is a very scary kind of cancer in the urinary tract. And since most of us are interested in some sort of medical um, field, I decided that it really needed to stay in lecture. I try to stick to majority lab material. This is definitely worthy of being introduced. Glands. This is very important to remember forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Glands make stuff, correct? Make secretions. But we have two different kinds of glands. We have endocrine glands, okay, so those belong in the endocrine system. And then we have exocrine glands. When you think of a sweat gland, that's an exocrine gland. A exocrine gland has a duct, and it's going to secrete its product onto a surface, like a mucous membrane. 
an endocrine gland during um, embryonic development, it loses its duct. And so its product actually has to be brought, um, it's going to, it's a protein going to be packaged up. Hormones are going to be um, either a protein or a lipid. It's going to get packaged up and then it's going to migrate into the blood and be carried somewhere. So some sort of transport system, maybe exocytosis or maybe some sort of pump, maybe facilitated diffusion, but whatever, it's going to have to migrate into the blood. It doesn't go through a duct with endocrine system. Endocrine, no duct. Exocrine, duct. Endocrine, hormone goes to the blood. Exocrine, all kinds of stuff, you know, maybe a pancreatic enzyme or sweat. Um, but anyway, it's going to go to a duct to a surface. We had the other duct, the uh, cell, uh, gland that you already met, the unicellular goblet cell. And we have some that are multicellular, cellular. most of them are multicellular. So this is showing the development. So initially, what's going to end up happening, we're going to have an epithelium that invaginates downwards, right? So this is embryonic. And if it's an exocrine gland, it's going to keep this neck right here. Maybe the end swell because we're going to be making a product and then it's going to go out the duct to the surface. But with endocrine gland, the duct gets lost during embryonic development and it's going to get a pretty good vascular uh, capillary supply because this guy makes hormones. Hormones don't have a duct so they actually are going to be put into the blood so that your blood can transport it to wherever it needs to go. Lots of hormones come from your brain and maybe your big toe needs to grow. You've probably heard of growth hormone. How does it get from your brain down to your big toe so your big toe can grow? The blood. Already said all that. And I didn't say that exocrine is more numerous. Uh, we do, we have a, you know, set number of endocrine glands, but you know, you probably have more sweat glands on your arm, just maybe on your forearm than a hundred times the number of exocrine glands that you have. Examples, mucus, sweat, oil, saliva. And then we've already talked about the goblet cell that makes mucin or mucus. Cool electron micro, uh, microscope picture of a goblet cell. So um, notice that even this, you can, because it's electron microscopy, you can see these details. You can see the rough ER right in here, these little lines right in here. The Golgi body is going to be packaging up right in here all these little vesicles that are full of mucus do to do and then it's going to come out to the apical surface right here so they have different structures and they have different ways that they secrete um i'm going to show you some pictures I don't want you to memorize these pictures though. You can definitely tell how we've got different kinds of shapes. Some of them are simple, some of them are very compound with lots of extra little things. Um, so really more, I just wanted you to see that we have different kinds of ducts, not that I want you to memorize all the different structures. But this, I do want you to know. How they secrete. So. Most of the time, it's going to be by exocytosis, but sometimes the whole cell is destroyed when it, that's how it releases its stuff. Kill the cell, now everything's going to squeeze out of the dead cell. When the whole cell is destroyed, that's a holocrine gland. 
when the product comes out by exocytosis, that's going to be a merocrine gland. So in this picture right here, this is showing these cells are busy making those little vacuoles full of whatever. Let's say it's a pancreatic enzyme. And the enzymes are going to exocytose into a duct, which is going to go this way, maybe join more ducts and eventually make it onto the surface of some sort of mucous membrane. This guy, these cells are dying. They're just plop, breaking like a water balloon, and so all of their um, product is going into the duct along with all the cellular debris.